My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I never held a very optimistic view of the level of intelligence, erudition, literacy and numeracy of the masses, but even I was shocked at the ease and facility of the government's ability to manipulate people, cow them, frighten them, herd them in, hold them in cattle pens. I was shocked by the speed of the process. I was utterly befuddled by people's willingness to surrender human rights, civil rights, social rights, the very fabric of society, in view of a nebulous threat of a virus which is invisible. And so I was very reassured when I read online about a survey conducted by a public relations company. The survey, the survey showed that 38%, that's almost half, of beer drinkers in the United States are going to refrain from drinking Corona beer in the future in order to not get infected with the virus. I'm kidding you not. You can go online, search for the survey on CBS News. 38% of beer drinkers and by the way, beer drinkers is a huge public in the United States. 38% of beer drinkers now forgo Corona beer because it might get them infected with the virus. With this level of intelligence and literacy in the general population, is it a wonder that politicians, their medical lackeys, and for higher intellectuals are doing with us as they please? Who is going to resist them? People who are afraid to get infected via beer, eponymous beer, are they going to be the new rebellion, the new resistance to what's being done? No siri, no way. This is cattle. These are not sheep even. They are the level of cattle. It reminds me of a book published in 1841 by Charles Mackay. He was a Scottish journalist. 1841, mind you, almost 200 years ago. The book was titled Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. It was an early study of crowd psychology. And he says there, men, it has been well said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds while they only recover their senses slowly, one by one. He was a clever chap, and his book is, to this very date, one of the best books about mass psychosis, mass hysterias, mass panic, and other such, as he called it at the time, extraordinary delusions. 300 years before, in 1511, there was another guy called Desiderius Erasmus, not his fault, and he was he, was, he used to live and work in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, and he published a book called In Praise of Folly. It was an essay which he originally wrote in Latin <clears throat> in 1509 and published two years later. And here's what he has to say in the book Praise of Folly. Just as nothing is more foolish than misplaced wisdom, so too nothing is more imprudent than perverse prudence. And surely it is perverse not to adapt yourself to the prevailing circumstances, to refuse to do as the Romans do, to ignore the party goer's maxim, take a drink or take your leave, to insist that the play should not be a play. True prudence, on the other hand, recognizes human limitations and does not strive to leap beyond them. It is willing to run with the herd, to overlook faults intolerantly and to share them in a friendly spirit. But they say that is exactly what we mean by folly. I will hardly deny it, as long as they will reciprocate by admitting that this is exactly what, is me what it means to perform the play of life. In other words, Desiderius Erasmus, kind of tongue-in-cheek, says everyone is an idiot. You better join in. You can't beat them. Simply join them. 
A voice, of, another voice of reason I found online, and I'd like to refer you to him, is Dr. Vernon Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, Vernon Coleman. 50 years experience, very well measured, reasoned, and analytical voice. And we need many of these. Before uh, I start with today's uh, topics, I would like to field a few questions that you have sent me. First of all, I never said that cytokines are cells. Cytokines are not cells, of course. They are substances. They are released by cells, like interfer interferons or interleukins. They are peptides. They're kind of short, short chain proteins. They are secreted by cells. What I did say in my video is that exactly like certain immune cells, cytokines attack the host tissue, attack the patient's own tissues. And in this sense, cytokines create an autoimmune disorders, disorder. It is known as cytokine storm. Actually, one of the main mechanisms uh, at the disposal of the SARS covariant 2 is a cytokine storm. It provokes an attack by cytokines on the patient's lung tissues. Even if the patient's immune system as a totality is depleted or immunocompromised, cytokines are out there destroying the lung tissue. A second question I have uh, received repeatedly is the issue of randomized controlled double-blind uh, tests or experiments or trials. I suggested in the video to pick up 10,000 people from each city and to conduct randomized controlled double-blind tests on them. And, and some people wrote to me and said, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a, an incidence trial. Well, that's because I didn't go into details in the video. The video was not about how to conduct randomized trials. It was about uh, COVID-19. Of course, what I meant is to divide this group into two. One group would receive one protocol of treatment and another would receive another regimen, a regimen of treatment. And then we will see which of the two work. One of them would be the control group, and one would be, would be the, the main group, the trial group. And then we will see which of the uh, treatment options work, which of the interventions work, uh, whether testing, when testing should be conducted, and so on and so forth. So the people should be selected randomly, but they should be divided and include a control group. And each of them, of course, should be treated differently in order to make sense and to learn something new. Finally, there's the issue of masks. Everyone is very triumphant. Uh, in my first video, I said that masks are useless and actually counterproductive. And everyone says, you see, you were wrong. CDC just recommended to wear masks. Well, CDC recommended to wear masks under public pressure, not the other way around. The medical literature is absolutely unequivocally clear. And this is still the recommendation of the World Health Organization. Masks are counter counterproductive. Masks provide a false sense of safety. Very few people know how to put masks properly. And it was discovered in numerous studies over decades that when people put on masks, they touch their faces in order to adjust the mask. And that actually is a major vector of infection. If the virus is airborne, the mask is also useless because outside the droplet, the virus is so small that it can enter the mask, it can penetrate the mask, and then the mask becomes a death trap because it traps the virus. In between the mask and the face, there's a whole space filled with viruses. So generally, every doctor will tell you masks should not be worn in pandemics. They are dangerous. That the CDC opted differently, it was under pressure, pressure by the media and so on. Masks have one major advantage. They give a psychological sense of safety and security, a psychological sense of shielding or protection. They are like a very antiquated firewall that gives the computer user the illusion that he is protected against malware. Well, if that's what turns you on, makes you feel safer, go ahead, put a scarf, put a mask, or any cloth barrier between you and the world. It won't help you, medically speaking. It might do something to your psychology. And finally, nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Nothing is more stable 
than the transient. The power grabs by politicians in Serbia, in Hungary, in Turkey, in China, in Italy, in Russia, and in the United States, forget about it. These power grabs are for good. They're going to be with you for the rest of your lives and your children's lives. Have a look at what happened after 9-11. After 9-11, many civil rights and human rights were suspended. Were they ever returned? Were these policies, were, 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 did, did anyone reverse them after 9-11? No. They're still with us. They're still here. The Patriot Act is still valid 20 years after 9-11. Every human right and every civil right relinquished during this pandemic is gone for good. You want it back? You have to fight in the streets. We have given up our democratic rights, many of our civil rights and human rights, including free speech, including free movement, for the sake of battling a pandemic which is, at this stage at least, far less worse than the flu. We'll talk about it in a minute. Right now, the emerging picture is that the case fatality rate of COVID-19 is either the same as a bad flu, a new strain of flu, or considerably less. Even some scholars say up to 10 times less. But I think it would be safe to say that, the, that SARS covariant 2 is anywhere between one to two times as powerful, as lethal, as a bad flu, a bad strain, a new strain of flu. It is, in other words, a very powerful flu. In Italy and Spain, cases in ICU, of, uh, admissions to ICU are slowing, new infection rates are slowing. It seems that in Italy, the Sp in Spain, the curve has been flattened and the pandemic is largely over. No thanks to social distancing or any of the quarantine measures. It's easily provable because there's a very long delay in incubation. This virus emerges and erupts after two weeks and there have been cases documented of the virus being dormant and latent in the body for one month before anything happens. Moreover, in the vast majority of cases, it's asymptomatic and presymptomatic. The National Institutes of Health now estimate that only 12% of COVID-19 victims, or self-imputed, or imputed COVID-19 victims, only 12%, one in eight, died from the virus. 88% died from other issues. There was virus in their bodies, but the virus did not cause the death. 99% of all patients admitted to Italian hospitals with uh, SARS covariant 2 virus in their bodies, had, these people had pre existing conditions. 75% of them have been above the age of 81. Professor Walter Ricciardi is a scientific adv advisor to, the, to Italy's Minister of Health. And here is what he has to say. I am quoting, as you see, I'm looking at the screen. That's what he has to say. The way in which we code deaths in our country is very generous in the sense that all of the people who die in hospitals with the coronavirus are deemed to be dying of the coronavirus. On re-evaluation by the National Institutes of Health, he says, only 12% of death certificates have shown a direct causality from coronavirus, while 88% of patients who have died have at least one premorbidity, many of them two or three. Studies conducted now, finally, in Italy, show that the number of actual infections in the populations may have been a hundred times the cases tested for and diagnosed. A hundred times. That means that the CFR, the case fatality rate in Italy, has been exaggerated by a factor of 25. 15,000 or 20,000 people are said to have died of COVID-19 in Italy. Divide this by 25, you get probably the real picture. In the United Kingdom, Oxford University um, reached a conclusion, Oxford University uh, medical scholars reached a conclusion that 50% of the British population might be infected. 
in the United Kingdom, the medical authorities declassified, I repeat, declassified COVID-19 as a high consequence infectious disease. And this didn't happen now. This happened on the 19th of, of March before the quarantine um, uh, measures. The WHO now says that 95% of COVID victims, 95% of mortalities, were above the age of 60 in Europe. 95%. So yes, it is a disease of old people. It's politically incorrect to say it. I am accused of lacking empathy when I say it. But it is a disease of old people. 50% of all the casualties in Italy were above the age of 80. 95% of everyone in Europe who is sick with coronavirus is above the age of 60. And just in case I'm suspected of ageism, I am almost 60. I, I don't belong to the young. Might come as a shock to many of you. And still I'm saying this is a disease of the old. And we are sacrificing the future. We are sacrificing the future to keep ourselves alive. The future does not belong to us. It belongs to young people. We, we have ruined the planet for them. We have created civil wars everywhere. We have displaced 70 million people. We fought two world wars. Isn't this enough? Isn't this enough what we have done to the young generations? Shouldn't we just back off? And if some of us die, by latest measures, 0.06% of us die. Well, I have a shocking surprise. All of us have to die of something. COVID-19 is a cause of death. It's a natural cause of death, exactly like tuberculosis, exactly like the flu, exactly like other types of pneumonia, which are the fourth cause of death among people above the age of 65. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDCP, now is telling us that from January until today, 38 million people got the flu in the United States. 390,000 of them spend a few days in hospital. And of these, 23,000 people died. Yes, not of COVID-19, of the flu. By the end of the season, 40,000 are projected to, to die of the flu. I think enough is enough. Enough with this unjustified panic. We should institute rigorous testing of wide swaths of the population, randomized controlled trials, tracking of contacts, of course, contact tracking. We should isolate vulnerable populations. We should institute social distancing with vulnerable populations, lockdowns of heavily affected communities. And we should get back to work, and get back to life, and hand back the world that we have hijacked to the young.